Strong connections are vital in our lives, yet in today's virtual world, it is often difficult to make meaningful connections. When team members are truly connected, retention improves, sales increase, customer loyalty soars, and our business grows. Today, you'll be hearing messages that are designed to fuel our passion and both connect and serve others. Keynote speaker Mark Scherenbrock wrote an award-winning book on connecting entitled Nice Bike, Making Meaningful Connections on the Road of Life. Mark has spent his career working in both education and business discovering, discovering how some of the best organizations and industry <coughs> build a culture that encourages personal and professional growth. Mark is a native of Minnesota, so am I, <laughs> and Emmy Award winner, Hall of Fame speaker, award-winning filmmaker, he's a Scorpio, he enjoys long walks on the beach, bacon, and beekeeping. Please welcome Mark Sharon Brock. Not too shabby, right? You know, it's a great read. It's just the very first time I've ever heard my official introduction with no applause whatsoever after it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's too late. Now you're just patronizing me, and I, I understand that. Oh, I have the laugh track ready to go. Sorry. I, I... <laughs> it does make it a little different, doesn't it, doing all this virtually? It is. Uh, I, I remember when the, the late night hosts all tried to do their shows with an audience of just their writers, and it was just, it was awkward. Yeah. Now that, you know, now that they're in their own homes doing their own shows, they're, they're catching their own piece of, of how to do it right. So it just takes some adjustments. Yeah, this is for sure. Um, so yeah, like I, like I kind of mentioned, I'm from Minnesota as well. I was born in Edina and, uh, you know, grew up a little bit in um, St. Paul. So we're back there quite a bit, hanging out with family and friends. So that's how I uh, met your daughter. Hey, but you have no, uh, oh, yes, we met Kate. No yes. Minnesota accent, Kyle. Geez, what happened to you along the way? I know. Well, I've got moved to uh, Arizona and then got moved to California. So, oh, crepes, the California thing will take it all away. No, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Every once in a while, though, it slips back in, and that's okay. I don't mind. Good. All right. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that you talk about that I've seen um, is very connected to the wedding industry. Um, it resonates very well with what we do. We are a very social business we work with people we don't know we get to meet them for the first time and the last time you know we meet them they come to an event a wedding and then they go back home to wherever they may have come from out of state out of country uh, we do make connections and friends with the bride and the groom and their immediate family in their area but my question for you is how do you connect with others now especially that you're staying six feet apart Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, for those of us that are sharing this moment together, a lot of you are involved around weddings, around events, and we're, we're all in the same boat. Um, I had just a, a wonderful spring all lined up from March all the way through the summer with events, and starting with my very first one, March 2nd or so, boom, the dominoes, and they all went away. Everything's postponed to the fall. So, and I'm guessing everybody else out there, same thing. Uh, I mean, it's just, holy moly, there goes our, there goes our livelihood and, and what we do that, that we love so much. So part of it's uh, learning how to deal with the situation of, you know, moving forward. And in the meantime, can we do something that's meaningful for people uh, that still works for us and for them? But yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, we're at our cabin. Susie is my bride. We've been married for, we're coming on June 4th. It'll be 43 years together. Congratulations. Very good. Thanks. And so we're holed up here at our cabin up in Northern Minnesota. And I'm going to take you out. We've had uh, two out of our three kids get married on the point out here. Uh, just, yeah, right out there. Right Beautiful. on the point. Beautiful. Oh, that's and, gorgeous. Uh, just under 200 people at each of the weddings. And we felt bad. We wanted to have more children just so we could have more weddings because it was <laughs> it was such an amazing event. It's a uh, it, it was incredible, and one was pouring all day with Katie uh, up until the time for the vows. We went all right, everybody, let's head out to the point, and it was just 
it was it was magical. So we're still thinking maybe adopting some 18, 19 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> we can't let go of it. It's just Good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. It's a, that's, a, that's a beautiful uh, backyard, is it? You know? Yeah, it's just it's our cabin up here. It's on a point, um, but it's a, it's a great wedding site. You go fishing, you go fishing very often? I'm sorry? You go fishing very often? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's yeah. it been a great a pandemic backup. Yeah. Um, so... How do, how do we, especially with a stay at home right now, and things are starting to lighten up a little bit, and, and you know, we're going to start getting our, our feet back under us real soon, hopefully. But how do we make meaningful, meaningful connections with our peers, the people that are here, the people that are in our industry, and connect with them? Well, you know, I, I think we all found that um, two things. Uh, everyone I know has reached out to people they haven't talked to for a long time, just to touch base. Um, so there's, there's a lot of which there's a lot of silver linings. One is touching base with, with people that you haven't touched base with for a while. Um, you know, but the biggest thing is the, the hunger that's now built up that we now realize how important these human connections are. Uh, we're dying to go out to a restaurant. We're dying to go to a, a big wedding and have that dance. And we're just, we're just, when we start to get back into it, I think people are going to be more celebratory and appreciative. Anytime you take something away from somebody that they've, you know, not that we take it for granted, but we take it for granted. And when, when we're back into it, I think it's going to be more celebratory. Uh, everything we do, everything, every little special touch. But in the meantime, it's just staying in touch with people that we care about, that we love uh, any way we can. Awesome. Now, I, I remember in listening to your stories that you had shared a story about your dad. Um, and when you guys had done a little traveling um, back to the, the wall. Mm. Can you can you share that with us? Some of them haven't heard this before. I think it's amazing. Well, it's in, uh, if you watch our preview on, on nicebike.com, it's the last story of the preview. Uh, although the, the whole story takes longer. My dad was a, a World War II guy, uh, served in the Pacific on an aircraft carrier. Uh, but once he came home, I mean, never traveled outside the state of Minnesota. And uh, I finally said, Dad, let's, let's take a father-son trip. Uh, it'll be our bonding experience. I didn't say that out loud, but I thought that. Right. Because he, he wasn't that warm, fuzzy, teddy bear kind of a guy. I mean, he was always there for me, but... Uh, not one that's going to sit down and share a lot of wisdom with you. And uh, we went, in fact, some of my best memories as a kid were Saturday mornings at the VFW. Uh -huh. You go grocery shopping in the morning and then 1030, he made the announcement, Aggie, I'm going to go to the VF. VF, short for VFW. She, he had to abbreviate that. <laughs> and uh, she always said, well, take the boy with you. Because I was the boy. I was the youngest. And so our, our best Saturday mornings are spent with the crew, which were all World War II guys. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but my Saturday morning seminars were spent with World War II heroes. Wow. They'd never talked about it, but once I got old and started researching the backgrounds of Ron Sutzer and Leo Gruber and Lenny Keller and Bud Streitz, these guys were incredible. From the Battle of the Bulge to uh, Normandy, uh, to the, uh, it was just amazing. Uh, but my dad and I took a trip to D.C. and uh, took a walk late at night. We were in the Lincoln Memorial, decided to take a left, and really quite by accident stumbled upon the Vietnam Memorial. And I was in the last lottery to go. My number is 256. If you had a low number, you were going to Vietnam. If you had a high number, you were staying home. And it's amazing. Ask any boomers, um, the men out there, what their lottery number is. And they'll, they'll tell you within a moment. They can't remember their own cell phone number, but they'll tell you their lottery number <laughs> because it's, it's burned into their minds. It just is. And uh, because it meant either men went there or men served in our place, which we still carry deep in our heart. And as we're walking the wall, uh, there's two Vietnam vets standing there very quietly. One of the men had their hand on a name on the wall. 
and my dad really totally out of character said, Mark, come here a second. He said, excuse me, fellas, were you, uh, were you over there, Vietnam? And the guy said, uh, yeah, yeah, we were. And he said, well, uh, thank you, fellas. Welcome home. And the Vietnam vet, his eyes started to well up with tears. And he said, sir, you are the very first person who has ever said thank you to me for serving the country that I love. And he came over and gave my dad a big bear hug. And my dad was not really accustomed to hugging at that point in his life. But it was, it was the greatest connection I've seen of, you know, when TSA is burned into our brains. If you see something, say something. But it works on the other end, too. And, you know, so the lessons I learned from my dad were all from watching and experiencing versus, versus let me teach you a lesson, son. Uh, so the, that was a... I mean, every, every son wants that moment with their father that kind of unveils who that person really is. And that was a moment for me. Yeah. Well, it sounds amazing. I mean, you know, I was lucky that I think my dad was at that cusp on the, on the lottery. Obviously, I don't know his number. Um, but uh, my mom got pregnant with my older brother, who's no longer with us. But and that's what determined whether he stayed or went and uh and he stayed and got to raise a family and stuff like that so but amazing amazing guy so it sounds like very just so many moments throughout life just make those connections how how do we inspire our guests how do we inspire our our clients and and make those connections with them well, i mean like, a whole nice bike message the nice bike message, uh, the metaphor is based upon, I was speaking in uh, north of Milwaukee. I live in Minneapolis, uh, flew to Mini Milwaukee, dr drove up north uh, to Nina for a presentation and uh, rented a beige Taurus from Avis. And I, I realized within a short amount of time, I had just landed in the middle of the Harley Davidson 100th year anniversary. Wow. I, 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 I'm, a million bikers, half a million. I, it was just nothing but leather, tattoos, do rags, chrome, and just this essence of Old Spice toughness. It was <laughs> great. And I, I'm not a Harley guy. I, I've never even sat on a Harley. But in my beige Taurus that day, I wanted a Harley. I want to be part of that Harley tribe, you know. And I kept pulling over these different venues because I was curious. And you'd see this big tough guy standing there by his bike and. Somebody walked by and go, oh man, nice bike. And this big teddy bear smile would come up on this Harley owner. And you saw this instant connection made between the two. And the next day I was talking to a group of teachers to kick off their school year. And I said, you know, I was just kind of bad living, kind of doing a rift on what I had just experienced. And I said, you know, tomorrow is the first day of school when, when kids come up to your door and walk into the classroom, instead of saying good morning and good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, try out, oh, Kyle, it's so good to have you in my class this year. I'm excited to have you here. Come on in. That's a nice bike. That's this connection you make right out the bat. And all the teachers kind of nodded. And I thought, wow, well, okay, this ad lib, I've got something here on, on a premise that I can work with. And what it's, down, what it's boiled down to, nice bike is a metaphor about how we are with others by acknowledging, honoring, and connecting with them. Okay. Now, acknowledging is, is being fully present. It's to be there. When we're so distracted nowadays, to, to honor is to uh, create experiences for others. You know, make an investment in their memory bank. And to connect is, is to own that moment, that you've got some power in this world to make some difference. So to own that moment and connect with others. That's how, that's how Nice Bike all came about. Wow. That's amazing. Um, and that, that is, like I said, that's kind of the industry we're in too, in, in that connecting and honoring them and, and bringing in the parents who've been married for 46 years, you know, 50 years, whatever it might be. How, how do you see that changing in the future now with COVID and, and as far as, 
you can't do the same quite connection. You can't walk, walk up to somebody and just hug them, you know, or even shake their hand for that matter. Um, so we have to be a little more in tune, I guess, with what we're doing. Um, how do you see things maybe changing going forward on how we can make that connection with people? Are you talking about within uh, your industry, the, the wedding industry? Well, or you I think honestly, in just in general, not, not just the wedding industry. I mean, yes, when we're, when we're sitting with a bride, um, there's a connection there already because, you know, we have that personality of working with them and excited for their event. So we have the same passion. They're passionate about their wedding. We're passionate about performing for their wedding, whether it's officiating or coordinating or taking the photos or being the DJ or whatever it might be. We're passionate about that. But in general, we're, we're trying to make that connection with people, whether it's the, the bride or it's other professionals or it just in a business sense, you know, we're trying to build those relationships. You know, you know, I, I, within the wedding industry and that most amazing event, uh, like some of the people with us today, I'm an officiant, uh, ordained on the internet. I'm not sure if that counts. Yep. Uh, <laughs> It counts. I've got seven seven weddings under my belt, and six of the couples are still together. So I'm, hey, that's I'm, I'm not sure how my odds are compared to everybody else. But uh, I I think the wedding day, as you know, is is one of the most magical events in your life. Uh, I still, forty three years ago this June, look back at our wedding, and it was that was the greatest day of my life. I mean, when you're surrounded with two hundred people that just love and care about you. I mean, talk about it, that strong human bond and connection. And as far as nice bike moments within that, um, you know, one of the best things that, that we ever advice we gave to our kids were that as soon as this ceremony was over, uh, starting with a couple, to steal away to a spot, grab a glass of champagne, just the two of you, and take 12 minutes before you go see anybody because of all this excitement, of all the things that are going on, take a moment just to slow down and say, hey, can you believe this? And have that, that moment together before you come out and see anybody so that couple can have that moment of connecting with each other. Um, I love it, and you know, we've lectured our kids out. No, we've encouraged our children. <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> the, all of these guests that are taking their time out and, and bringing their love and uh, bringing you gifts and bring their time to make sure that you, I mean, I hate to use the word, but to work the room, uh, to go to every single table and connect with them and, and, you know, do your best to know the name of everybody there and introduce each other uh, because sometimes it's a first time meeting. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's an important way to connect. And you know, one last thing is the, uh, I think it's nice when, when both couples, uh, the parents on both sides, get some mic time and are able to do a welcome. I mean, the, the father bride is always welcome to do that toast, but I think it's really good for both sides to welcome everyone there and, and get up on the mic before dinner and say, just we're so appreciative of having everybody here. Again, connecting both families together at that moment. Yeah, that that is the heart, I think, of what we're trying to do. And I'm sure Dave, myself, we've all got stories of weddings that we've been to where we saw that connection just happen and it's amazing. How, how, how did you meet your wife, speaking of, of, of her 43 years ago? Um, we were both student council kids, student government kids. Uh -huh. And uh, so everybody goes to camp in the summertime. We went to a leadership camp and uh -huh. I was a, a junior counselor which means I was a college kid as a junior counselor helping out. And she came in as a high school senior. I noticed her, but you, that's a verboten. But she came back the next year as a junior counselor and it was the love flourished and bam. Wow. We got married a year later. I, mean, I remember when she asked me about two months into the relationship, Where, where's this going? And I said, I'd like to marry you. She said, I, I just wondered if you're going to call me. I wasn't really looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, slow, slow, slow down just a little bit, Mark, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Dave on. Dave's got a, a question, Dave, if you want to unmute. There you go. 
Go ahead, Dave. Uh, a couple of things, Mark. First of all, um, I watched one of your videos the other day when Kyle was, uh, when he sent out the invite for us to join you. And um, uh, I was doing great until you got to the, the part at the Vietnam Memorial. And mm -hmm. uh, my eyes teared up for two reasons. One, my dad passed when I was a very young boy. He was a Vietnam and Korea vet. And uh, as an EMT, I was able to go on the honor flight uh, from Fresno uh. to Washington, D.C. with, uh, I think we had uh, 94 World War II and Korea veterans and, and Vietnam veterans. And it was the most amazing experience in my life. And I've had a lot of really great experiences, but uh, that really got to me when you said that because I had experienced that. And, and the thinking of those vets is, uh, is kind of a surprise to some of them sometimes. So I totally agreed with you on that. And that in that same segment, you mentioned, uh, and, I, and I should have gone back and reviewed it, but it just kind of triggered a little earlier when we were talking before we joined you. You had said something about a, a, a person who is, um, who has, and I forget, it, it has commitment and compassion is, is seen as, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact words you used, but, um, they're arrogant. Somebody oh, yeah. who has this and this is arrogant, but somebody who has this and this is seen as compassionate or something. Do you remember that segment that, I, I, that I'm referring I, to? I do, Dave, and, and thanks. And uh, boy, boy, your, your father must have been amazing. Um, well, we, you know, we talk about having confidence. And what I came up with, I was thinking about one time, is that uh, confidence with, without compassion is arrogance. A confidence with compassion is a connection. And I think we've seen that uh, in those people we've, you know, in our own lives and uh, that are bigger lives of, within leadership, of those that are just confident but don't care about others, just arrogance. You, do, you don't want to be around them. But when they have compassion for others. Um, I, I remember when I, I spoke to a group of, it was a, it was a 21st century cardiac Cardiac uh, Surgical Society. 50 of the top cardiac surgeons across the US based upon their own selection process. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a, a conference where they, they all get together and they're talking about cutting edge research and everything else. And they were brilliant. And I, I was a pair of white socks and a pair of, in a tux just saying, St. Cloud State, what am I doing here? I mean, but what really struck me was their compassion uh, for their patients, uh, for others, and, and a sense of real service leadership. Um, I mean, it's, it's how we serve others is how we make that connection. But that's, that's the quote, Dave. I got it down. I, I like that for a couple of reasons. One, you were talking about encouraging people to speak. I always encourage my brides and grooms to uh, say something to their guests because as many of you have mentioned in the chat that you know you never get that chance to, to have all these people together. So uh, sometimes they're hesitant. Sometimes the, the male is a little more dominant. We'll speak for both of them, but I've been pretty good at getting both of them to, to speak. Um, and I think that's going to be even more important now with all of the, the mess that's been going on with the, the virus and moving weddings and, and, and not being able to see family or your older parents or grandparents. So uh, I, I really think that's important. And I think that your statement is important because I was on an emergency call um, a few weeks ago and, and uh, it was a pretty serious call. And I, I walked in and, and uh, the gentleman had on his hat and it was a U.S. Navy veteran. And I said, hey, what's your name? And and what branch were you in? And my partner goes, we don't have time for that. I go, yes, we do. We do have mm. time. Because it puts that person at ease where a lot of times we're so focused on what we're doing that we forget that we're dealing with a person. And I think that same thing can be connected with our brides and grooms is when they call on the phone, you just don't say, you know, here's my price and thank you very much. You try to make that connection with them. And that's very important for us to, to do. I, I think I think it's really important to uh, for a bride and groom, especially the bride, to have faith in that event planner, uh, in the officiant, in those that she surrounds, that the couple surround themselves with, uh, the partners surround themselves with, because 
you know that something's going to go wrong. And um, it, it just does. <laughs> I mean, on, on uh, our wedding with our daughter, we had, a, we had a bulldog. We lost him named Cooper, just the coolest bulldog in the world. Everybody loved that dog. But for the wedding outside, we didn't think as far as what to do with the dog. It just didn't, had no idea. And so we walked, Susie and I walked our daughter Kate up um, and then the last person to make the walk up after Kate was the dog, <laughs> <laughs> who, who just kind of walked up very regally and sat down right there with Kate uh, through the whole service. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great picture, but, and it was wonderful. I mean, it was one of those unexpected great plums uh, that can happen. And, and I think to encourage the couple that, there are going to be some fun, unexpected moments that happen. Go with them and enjoy that moment because it's, uh, it's part of the magic of that event. Wow. It's funny that you say that because I did a small ceremony on Friday and the groom shows up with all of his guys. He's got three dogs. And um, during the ceremony, one of the dogs peed on her dress. <laughs> And they just laughed it off. Everybody's like, you know, like horror. And, and she just laughed it off and was like, you know, these are, our, these are our fur babies and that's just the way things go. And I, I don't know if I was a bride. I don't know that I'd have been that understanding, but you're right. Those things happen. And, and she just rolled with it. And I, I thought it was fantastic because there was no need to get upset in the middle of, you know, the, the ceremony. You know, when you mentioned quotes, Dave, uh, one of my favorites, came from Barbara Jordan, um, first black woman of color from uh, Texas, elected to Congress from Texas, first woman, first black. And um, her quote blew me away uh, when she said, it's more important to be interested than interesting. Um, that if you want to make a connection with it, that, that was her quote. And that just, because I always thought that you know, to be liked by others, you, you had to be interesting. You had to be cool or hip. And people from New York are, and people from California are, people from the Midwest and Minnesota, we're just cold. And uh, I always thought to, to be, you know, you, you have to be interesting. And she just took that, that away and said, no, it's more important to be interested. And, and if you're curious about others and their story, I think the, the greatest way as an event planner, as an officiant is, especially officiants know this too, to know the story, to ask the questions. Um, we've been away from our, our son and our, our son and our daughter. We had a picnic with them on uh, one of the lakes around Minneapolis last night, six feet apart. It's the first time we'd seen them in about a month. We missed them a great deal. And my, my new son in law is two years into the wedding now, Patrick Sidoti, um, continues to just amaze me because he used to be in broadcasting and it, it just, we had talked about golf for some reason. He said, I, I remember when I, I interviewed Arnold Palmer, my very, few, my very first celebrity interview in sports was with Arnold Palmer. And I went, whoa, 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 wait, you interviewed Arnold Palmer on, on television for an interview, sports interview? He said, yeah. Oh man, why didn't you lead with that when you first met us? <laughs> I mean, you had, you had two years to pull out the Arnold Palmer story? It's a bunch of celebrities. I was doing, oh my God. It just, it's one more reason why I love this kid. I mean, he would walk on hot coals for our daughter, which I made him do just to make sure that he would. But, <laughs> I mean, this is how humble this kid is to wait two years to just bumble upon the Arnold Palmer story and the Wayne Gretzky story of the interviews he did as a young broadcaster because he's always curious about others. He does the most beautiful thing. He's in advertising now. And when he meets with a, a major client or any client, matter of fact, he always takes out a Sharpie and on his, right here above the thumb, writes the word, listen. Even to the point where the person that he's talking to might even notice. Because more than once he's been asked, what, what's on your hand? He said, this word, listen. It's just a reminder for me that you're the most important person in this room. And that's where my focus should be. And I, I, I love that. And I, so again, it's, it's that Barbara Jordan, it's more important to be interested than interesting, uh, to take an interest in that others, to make that connection, to honor them and be uh, fully focused. So, great quote. 
Um, anything interesting at any of, I know you've done a lot of presentations, but um, is there any one question or, or experience that you had with an attendee that stands out? With, with an audience member? Um, you know, I have, it's very kind of you to ask Dave. I've got, I've done 4,500 presentations in my life. And I started as a, a high school assembly speaker. I was in a comedy group in high school. Uh, we wanted to form a band and meet girls, but none of us had any musical abilities. So we formed a comedy group instead, which doesn't attract anybody except for fellow comedians. And the group went on tour for a while. We had a blast. And when the group broke up because of my wife, Yoko Ono, I went as a, a solo as a high school assembly speaker. And not kids at a church youth group, but 2,000 kids in a gym, which is like a lion's den. And I, I think the best experiences I had, and, and for 20 years, I, I, I spoke at high school assemblies about, my presentation was called The Greatest Days of Your Life So Far, which means that high school is not the best time for a lot of people. But as long as you're here, be a part of it. Be engaged. Don't be a jerk. Be kind to others. Share your talents. Don't compare them to other people. Um, I, I always told the story about how in first grade I was so excited because the, it was right after lunch. The teacher asked us to, uh, it was coloring time. So I pulled out my box of five crayons, large Catholic family. I always had junk drawer crayons, those gnarly crayons in a cigar box left over. It was the first time I ever had my own <laughs> box of five never been used crayons by any human being. It was like, I felt like Picasso for the first time in my life. Little girl sitting next to me reached into her little Gucci attache case and pulled out a box of 9,000 crayons, sharpener in the back, three decks, metallic colors. <laughs> Looking at me saying, uh, I mean, and she, and she, was, she was excited and she should have been. These, that was a beautiful box of crayons. But she looked at me and she said, I have 17 different shades of orange. And I looked down and I thought, God, I don't even have orange. <laughs> You know, when, what happens are very early on, you start counting, you start comparing, you start noticing the kid with the bigger box of crayons or the kid that gets the, the A's all the time instead of the C's or then it turns into job titles and it turns into bank accounts, it turns into zip codes, it turns into everything. And you, you, you know, you can't win because no matter how many crayons you have, Bill Gates will always have more. <laughs> so what I tried to teach in high school students were stop conning crayons, just draw pictures. Mm -hmm. And I think within your profession, it's the most beautiful profession for, for coloring. Because every wedding you have is different. Every wedding you have is unique. Every wedding you have is, is a once in a lifetime experience, hopefully for that couple yeah. for a while for those partners. And to, to, to create this image and this picture. Uh, versus comparing it to all these other events because it can't be the same. It's, it's got to be different. But it, to answer your question, Dave, I had so many great experiences with students. Um, you know, I spoke at Columbine a year after that shooting, and it was a very difficult experience. Uh, um, and, I, and I've been in about four or five situations like that where you've had tragedies. But I think it's the resiliency that, that high school students have. And I think they will again. We feel bad for this class of 2020. Um, that they're they're going to have a different version of their graduation. But I don't know about you guys, but when you when you're excited for Mexican food or Chinese food or whatever it might be, and you go to a restaurant out of town and it doesn't live up to your experience, you you want to go someplace else and and get some really good Mexican food or really good Chinese food because you you want to make up that that experience that you missed. Right. I think it's the same thing with kids. They miss this big graduation experience that they thought about for their whole lives, 18 years. And I think they're going to be looking forward to um, some other event. You know, hopefully it's a wedding. Hopefully it's the, uh, those milestones of one's life that they will fully celebrate and immerse themselves in. So, Mark, what's, uh, you mentioned a couple of different types of events. That you, what's the most unique event that you've spoken at where you're like, wow, I, this is just out of left field. 
uh, uh, my Aunt Loretta was a member of the Central Minnesota Square Dance Association. <laughs> um, so she said, Mark, you'd like to speak to my Square Dance Association, wouldn't you? I said, of course I would, Aunt Loretta. <laughs> it, was, it, was like, it was like a really bad movie. It was the, everything about it was just weird. <laughs> but Aunt Loretta, was, Aunt Loretta was happy, so I was happy. Uh, you know, sometimes you do things for family. Yeah. Yep. And that's okay. Um, who's your, uh, of all the characters you've come up with, and how many characters have you come up with, and who's your favorite? That's kind. I, um, when I was a kid, I saw a movie of uh, Jimmy, James Cagney as Lon Chaney, Man of a Thousand Faces, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated with it. Um, and, and so I love doing characters in the comedy group. I always did a lot of different characters. So in my presentations, I don't use PowerPoint. Um, in fact, I remember when a young event planner said, could you send us your slides in your, your image deck? And I said, I, I don't have any, I, I don't use a PowerPoint. She said, wow, that's really cutting edge. <laughs> 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 which, was a, which was a first for me. I mean, that never happened before. Um, <laughs> But what I like to try to do is uh, hopefully be a bit different and not predictable. And I want to, instead of showing an image on the screen, I want to be able to, I'm a real fan of old time radio. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to create that image in the mind and on the stage and create an experience versus showing one on the screen. So, and I, I always imitate people that no one else knows. Um, I do a great Al Capone because nobody knows what he sounded like. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do a great I do a great Leroy Radovich, who was my shop teacher back in high school. Um, and so I think to to bring these people alive, it's is what is the is the fun of it uh, to to convey the messages. Um, you the speakers that I admire are the ones that are not necessarily the hero of their own story, right but rather rather the observer. And so all the characters that I bring out are the people that had influence in my life and are the real heroes and lessons I've learned from them. I, I think one of my favorites is the, uh, um, the oldest teacher, the uh, living teacher. Oh yeah. Talk about Willie, uh, Willie Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a, uh, I like that one. I think he's a pretty, pretty amazing guy. Well, Mel, Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner did a, a piece of 2000 year old man. They used to go to uh, parties and just, do a riff and make it up as just ad lib the whole way through. And Justin's, I was doing work with at the time, uh, the class rings and the yearbooks were excited about the millennial class of 2000. In fact, they sold more class rings that year than any other time in history. And so they said uh, back in 95, we want to get our people kind of excited about the year 2000. So, okay, let me do a 2000 year old guy of where class rings were invented. Uh, it started with a Pope and we built from there. And uh, so that, yeah, that was that was the piece. Yeah, I thought that was pretty amazing, and and how you weaved in things to do with William Shakespeare and stuff like that. That to the teacher just seemed like natural conversation, and not something that was worldwide or known. And you know what I mean? It was just like they talk about the midsummers. You know, I oh, thought yeah. it was pretty amazing. It was pretty cool. Yeah, he's become the 2,000-year-old salesman, the 2,000-year-old uh, teacher, the 2,000-year-old wedding officiant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My first wedding was um, yeah. amazing. Is that, but which one is your favorite? Who do you, who do you, who do you like and who do you? I, I do a, a character called Coach Wally Bowers, who is the, uh, Wally Bowers is the, in my mind, the assistant offensive line coach, the Bemidji State Beavers in Bemidji, Minnesota. And he's the, the cliche coach that gets all the quotes wrong, you know? Like, and Coach Bowers, I don't know why he's got a Southern accent, but I gave him a Southern accent, uh, <laughs> a really bad one. But, but, you know, Coach Bowers, like a quote that you've all heard, but Coach gets it different, you know? Bowers would be something like, uh, you know, the, the thing is, people, people gotta know you care. You gotta care. Uh, like our old coach told us, people don't know how much you care until they know how much you know about what they care about. Because if they know that you care about it, then they'll care. And you got to care. You got to care. 
Yeah. So that's because uh, the good thing is, is that I, I screw up a lot and coach allows me a lot of freedom to screw up on a regular basis. It just becomes part of the show. It's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. So, um, does it, well, does anybody else have a question before I, I go on to my next question? If somebody does, I'd like to bring them in. This is, you know, open forum and, uh, you guys have been great uh, so far. Um, I don't see any hands raising. Everybody's just enjoying this. This, is, this has been great. Um, I, one other idea that Susie on the drive up here today, uh, she reminded me that um, our, at the first wedding, our first child that got married, it, it rained. It wasn't here. Um, it was at a different place. The bride picked it out. And uh, they didn't plan for rain. As we kept saying to her, I mean, she's a wonderful, amazing daughter-in-law. And we said, well, what if, what if it rains? She said, it's not going to. It's my wedding day. It's not going <laughs> to rain. Well, yeah, you, you know exactly what happened. It was a yeah. month soon. And um, they didn't have a tent set up. They had it set up for the, you know, all the, the dinner and celebration, but not for the ceremony. And, um, our son said, we got together with his bride to be in this. We're going to take a rain delay. Uh, we're going to wait. It looks like uh, looks like this storm might go away in a little bit. It's not going to go away. It's going to rain all day. <laughs> so we took a rain delay. So we said, well, okay, if you're going to do a rain delay, we're going to open the bar. And uh, we opened the bar, which was a brilliant move on our part. Um, and after about 20-minute delay, everybody had their cocktail. We had the wedding, and it turned out perfectly. But um, ever since then, we said, we're going to do a welcome drink for people. Mm -hmm. uh, when they arrive, we'll have some Prosecco ready for them. Uh, we'll have the bar available uh, for, for a beer or something. But something that says, when you get here, we want to welcome you. And uh, we've done those for other two weddings. And I, I thought that was a, a nice way to welcome people in. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not that alcohol does everything, but it was the very first miracle that Jesus did. So I, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, when you look at it that way. Um, now, hey, I mean, hey, for him to make wine before bringing up Lazarus, I think says a lot, okay? That's <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is true. This is true. <laughs> now, obviously, speaking gigs are on hold at the moment, um, you know, but how often or do you know of any plans of coming out to California anytime in the, in the future here? I, our first event that got canceled was in California uh, back in early March. Uh, so right now, uh, and I'm sure it's the same with all of you, uh, it's either going to be A, postpone, uh, hoping, hoping to figure this whole thing out, or B, do a different version of what we'd hoped before, either virtual or smaller, or give us a taste, and then later on we'll, we'll go with a full meal deal. Right. So, yeah, I mean, our calendar is totally up in the air right now, as I'm sure yours is too. Yeah. Although, who was it? It was a day that you just had a, a ceremony with. Um, how many people were at that? Jump in, Dave. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you uh, hang on? There we go. Oops. I uh, I had uh, thirty people were there. I was at a private uh, private uh, barn, and. Um, I was friends of the family. They moved their wedding to 9-11, believe it or not, because that was the only date in September that was open at that event site. Uh, so they just did the ceremony really quick. And then uh, we moved the, the actual celebration to the 11th of September. And that's happened with, with many of them. Um, a lot of the, I had a bride and groom in March. They got married in her backyard with about six or seven people. And their reception is coming up on June, June 27th. So uh, again, at a private residence. So a lot of these people are, are, are getting away from the venues and doing them somewhere where maybe they don't have to have quite the, the restrictions. But um, yeah, it was about 30 people. Mark. Hmm. And then I have a, a, a gal that contacted me a couple of days ago for a anniversary party for approximately 25 people in their backyard. So um, everything else, uh, so far, I, I was telling uh, the group before you came on, I've, I've had proms canceled, graduation parties, um, where I uh, had, um, you know, where I do sound for the stadiums, for graduations, 
um, about eight of those cancels, and then two weddings I lost because I simply wasn't available on the date they chose. And then I've moved so far, 17 weddings I've moved. Wow. Wow. And uh, I think eight, six of those, I didn't write that down. Six of those are were moved to 2021. They just moved it to the same weekend a year from now, which is, which is very hard for them. I've tried to be, I, I, maybe you can give us some advice on what to say to them because maybe like everyone else, I'm, I don't want to say, oh, I'm so sorry, or, you know, gosh, this sucks, you know, that's not what I want to say. Uh, you know, what, what would you think would be a very, you know, because uh, I don't want to sound arrogant, I want to sound, you know, make that, continue to make that connection. How do you think we should respond to those brides and grooms that continue to have to move? I've had, by the way, I've had one bride and groom move theirs twice. Their wedding was on uh, April 24th so they moved it to may 31st and they've had to move it a second time mm. so that's how unpredictable it's been at least for me but what what do you think would be an appropriate thing to say to a couple who has to move their wedding and in this case more than once well i i wish i was that magical or that good to have the <laughs> the, the the perfect statement because everyone is different i mean to me, it, it's, it seems like the toughest thing, uh, like the, the picture behind you, uh, right behind your left shoulder, you have a picture of a, uh, an older gentleman dancing. Um, and I, I think that, I mean, my mom was 97. Uh, Katie got married the last, last end of August, and we said goodbye to mom second week in October. And for my mother, like a lot of the grandmothers, you know, it, that's a milestone that they want to make to be able to dance at your, at your granddaughter's wedding. It's something I hope to dance at my granddaughter's wedding. And I think that's, that's the most difficult thing I think to deal with of the elders of the family to who are, who are so looking forward to making it to that moment. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe it might, keep, it might keep a lot of people alive saying, well, you know, Nana, you're gonna have to hang in there for another six months, babe, because... Uh, <laughs> well, there's that, but also I've had brides and grooms tell me that they've they move their wedding to a year from now because their older guests are afraid to travel or afraid to come to a larger yeah. gathering. So they've got multiple angles. It's not just, oh, the venue's closed or the social distancing or, or you know, the state's closed down, whatever it happened to be at the time. It's a lot of the guests have backed out, which forced their hand in some cases. Yeah, I've had the same thing. You know, I, I wonder if I, in those kind of cases, something might be kind of cool to do. Um, I know one, one big thing for our kids were to uh, interview their, their grandparents about World War II. Uh, they, all three of my kids for their elementary school project interviewed dad. And I wonder if it wouldn't be kind of cool uh, to, to go back to some of the elders and talk about their wedding day. Uh, talk about their courtship, how they met, and to go back and videotape that, to tape it, and to put some kind of show together uh, that could be used within a ceremony, to be used uh, at the celebration. I love that. Of, of, you know, where this whole love started from this family, and what their wedding day was like. And Because I loved it when my mom talked about the wedding on the farm, uh, with the homemade bar and it was it was really cool i think that might be a um, for those weddings to make sure that you know the ones where we might miss the elders through an illness or through because of time to still have them as, as part of that event through some kind of a really cool show one of the things that i've done in the past i don't do it very often because the brides don't generally jump on it for lack of a better term is I have a special phone number that they can call and record messages or their guests can. So let's say you were coming out to a wedding to California, but you couldn't make it. So you could actually call and record a message to the bride saying, you know, I'm glad that you're getting married or whatever you want to say from the heart. And those become things that they can keep forever. Um, so it's been kind of unique. You know, it's usually the, the elderly that can't make it. They're in a home or they're unable to travel for some reason or another. And those become memories that they get to keep. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of mention, because you kind of met, brought it up as far as memories go, one of the cool things that I do as a DJ, I do a few different things, but is I have a thing called the marriage dance. I've been doing it for about 25 years now. 
And what I do is I'll bring every married couple on the dance floor, including the bride and groom. And usually I have to remind them, no, no, you're married. You've been married six hours. Come on out here, you know? <laughs> so I get them all out there and I'll play a song. Um, and I have a specific song that I play. But uh, throughout the song, I dismiss people based on how long they've been married. Been married for five years, 10 years. One wedding I did, um, I got to the point where I got to, uh, the couple was married for 76 years. Wow. And so what I did is I brought the bride and groom back out. And then, by the way, the entire wedding, uh, everybody who got married had created a circle around the, this, this couple. So it became honoring for their marriage and their commitment to each other for that long. I brought the bride and groom back out. So we had the bride and groom and the grandparents out there. And usually what I'll do is I'll start off with the grandmother or that bride and say, you know, so you've been married for 76 years. What's your advice for this couple that's been married for 76 minutes, you know? <laughs> and you can tell the division of how long they've been married. It's usually somewhere around 40 years, 45 years. If it's less than that, it's usually something like, you know, make sure you communicate, say I love you, um, be there for each other, things like that. Over 55 years, <laughs> it's, Make sure his dinner's ready. Make sure you know, <laughs> things like that. That is just kind of funny. The division of you, know, you can kind of tell that line. But the most interesting answer I had, I asked the the, the grandfather. I said, "So, what's your advice?" And he said, "Well, sissy, because he's talking to his granddaughter. I got to tell you, in my seventy six years of being married, there's ups and downs. You're going to have great times. You're going to have difficult times. You're going to have." arguments and fights but in every fight there's a winner and there's a husband <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he left it with that but i thought that was one of the most memorable <laughs> moments <laughs> that moment i had at a wedding that was great you know the uh kyle you're familiar with uh, perkins yes perkins pancake place it's yep. a coffee shop breakfast oh, place yeah. um franchise but I remember our, the first year we got married, um, we went there for a breakfast. I think we were about a month into our wedding, or our marriage. And we saw two couples, older couples, which is anybody older than you are at that point, but two older <laughs> couples. It looked like we have been married for a long time. And one of the couples was in the booth, both of them reading the paper, uh, not even looking at each other. And the other couple in the other booth were holding hands and just in love. And you know, that, that's where we said, let's make a promise that we're gonna be that, that couple that's looking at each other versus the one looking at the newspaper. And I, I, you know, I think that's the most important thing. I mean, that, I mean that's the nice bike moment to yeah. not look with that other person versus just reading the paper and having a pancake. Yeah. Absolutely. There's so many opportunities to make a connection that we just have to be open to them. So um, this has been wonderful. This has been great. I, I think everybody has enjoyed hearing your stories and having you here. Um, is there a place on your website that you list events that, you're, that are public events? Obviously, if you're working, you know, and speaking at a corporate event that's kind of closed off to the public, but somewhere that we might be able to come out and, and see you, you know, and kind of keep track of an open schedule. Oh, that'd be great. I appreciate that. I mean, unfortunately, no, they're, they're mostly corporate events and, uh, and hopefully that'll, you know, we're hoping look the fall, maybe January, uh, we'll get back out there. But the, uh, we've got some YouTube clips, a nice bike is, uh, Amazon's got our book, Nice Bike, yep. Making Meaningful Connections on the Road of Life. Uh, but you can always watch some stuff on YouTube. That's, but, but no, yeah, I'm not doing any public events that people can just jump in, unfortunately. Well, someday, hopefully, there'll be one. Or maybe we'll bring you out here and make it a small business thing and be more open to the you know, small businesses. That would be great. I think they would gain a lot of insight with what you have to say. So, well, thank you immensely for being here and taking time out of your day to encourage us, inspire us, and, and just be a part of our lives. Thank you very much for that. 
Well, thanks. Thanks for taking time out, everybody. It's been a pleasure. It's been awesome. Thank you, guys.